Hey everyone, I just went to check out the fort's mailbox and it was full of letters from our friends. Let's see what this one from our friend Wally Woodfrog says. Hmm. It's shaped like a heart. That's weird. Oh, you're right. It's almost Valentine's Day. I totally forgot. Let's see what Wally's Valentine says. My body might be completely frozen through, but my heart stays warm when I think of friends like you, Wally. Oh, that's really sweet. Oh, you don't have to worry about Wally being frozen, Squeaks. He's a wood frog. Every winter they freeze, but they thaw out in the spring. We talked about wood frogs before, remember? <laughs> Well then, let's check out this video to remind you. Oh, brr. It's a lot colder outside than I thought. I should have worn my heavy jacket. <laughs> That's a good one. Squeak says that he's so cold, he feels like a rat sickle. Have you ever said, I'm freezing when you're cold? I know I say it all the time, even though I'm not really frozen like an ice cube. But did you know there's a totally amazing animal that actually does freeze every winter? Yep, wood frogs will freeze when it gets cold. They really become frog sickles. Then when it gets warm, they thaw out and hop away perfectly fine. It's a pretty sweet trick in more ways than one. And I'll tell you all about it while we're warming up. For a lot of animals, staying out in cold weather for a long time can be bad news. That's because bodies of living things have a lot of water in them. And what happens to water when it freezes? Yep, it turns to ice. And if we look at ice really closely, we can see that it's made of tiny bits of frozen water stuck together in a fancy pattern. A pattern is something that repeats, like the hexagons in a beehive. In ice, bits of frozen water stick together and make a special design that repeats again and again. We call this pattern a crystal. Because it's in that special pattern, water that's frozen into ice crystals takes up more space than water that's liquid. This is why it's not a good idea to freeze water in glass bottles. As the liquid gets colder and starts forming ice crystals, it gets bigger so big that it can cause the glass bottle to crack. And if water is in an animal's body when it freezes, it can cause a lot of damage, even if the animal eventually warms up and the water turns back into liquid. But somehow, wood frogs are able to freeze every winter and survive. In part, that's because not all of the water in the frog's body freezes. Only most of it does. So even though the wood frog would feel hard as ice if you held it in your hands, parts of its body aren't completely frozen solid. These parts are less like a popsicle and more like a slushy. To keep from dying, the frog has to keep the water in some of its most fragile body parts, like its heart, liquidy. And you might be wondering, how does it do that? Well, it fills those parts with sugar. Yep, sugar. The same stuff that helps to make treats taste sweet can keep water from freezing quickly. You can even try this out yourself. Ask a grown-up to help you get two identical plastic cups. You definitely want plastic here, so there's no risk of broken glass. Put the same amount of water in each cup. Then mix several spoonfuls of sugar into one of the cups. Mark the cup with the sugar in it so that you don't get the two cups mixed up. And put them both in the freezer. Check on the cups once every hour or so. You should see that the water without the sugar freezes much faster than the one with the sugar. Why do you think that is, Squeaks? Oh, it's okay not to know. It's a tough question. Let's think about what we do know. That ice forms when little bits of water get really cold and form a specific pattern called a crystal. So how might the sugar play into that? Oh, that's right. The sugar messes that pattern up. As the sugary water gets colder, the water part wants to form ice crystals, but the sugar literally gets in the way. Eventually, some of the water is able to make the pattern and make a small piece of ice. And these small pieces of ice manage to get together to make larger pieces of ice, basically pushing the sugar out of the way. But it does take longer. As for our frozen frog, as long as enough water in the frog's body stays liquidy enough that its most fragile parts don't form ice crystals, 
it can make it safely through the winter. Now, moving the sugar around its body is only one trick the frog uses to survive freezing. It also moves the water that does freeze into body parts that are tough enough to take it. And scientists think there's even more to it than that, but they're still trying to figure it out. Ultimately, we know this frog's super sweet tricks make it so that when the weather does warm up again, the frog can too. And once the frog thaws out, it hops back to its usual life as if it was never frozen, which I think is pretty cool. So you see, our friend Wally's okay, even though that doesn't explain how he sent us this letter, since it's still winter. Oh well, what's next? This one is from our friend Grady the Tardigrade. Tardigrades are very, very small living things, which means they write very small letters. Hmm. I might need to look at this under a microscope. One second. It says, when I'm out on the prairie wrangling bacteria, my heart's always longing for home. Cause being alone is really inferior to having friends to call your own. Yeehaw! That was great. We really need to make some Valentines to send back, Squeaks. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> While we're thinking something up, let's check out this episode where Grady taught us all about soy. Hi everyone, I was just working in the fort's greenhouse and Squeaks, I have some good news. The plants are doing really well. Pretty soon, we should be able to make a yummy salad out of the vegetables we're growing. Gardening can be a bit dirty, but it's worth it. As I was cleaning up, I started thinking that maybe we should take a closer look at the dirt our plants grow in. What we often think of as just dirt, especially when we have to clean up, is really interesting. Scientists would actually call the dirt in our gardens soil, and it's home to an incredible number of living things. Oh, that's right, Squeaks. We can see a few animals like earthworms when we're digging in the garden, and they're super important. They help the plants in our garden to get the air and food they need to grow. But there are other living things in the soil that we can't see with our eyes. We need tools like this microscope to see them. Let's give it a try. Howdy up there. I had a feeling I was being watched. Oh, hi. We didn't mean to startle you. I'm Jesse, and this is Squeaks. We're hoping to learn more about the kinds of living things in soil. Well, you sure have come to the right place. Name's Grady. Glad to meet you. I'm what's called a tardigrade. Some people like to call my family and I water bears or moss piglets, but we're our own little group of living things. Emphasis on the little. Most of us are only half a millimeter long, about the size of a period at the end of a sentence. So we tend to get overlooked a lot. Well, I'm sure glad we didn't overlook you. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your neighborhood? Well, it would be my pleasure. The soil I live in is a mixture of things like water, small pieces of rock, and air. It also has a lot of what we call organic matter. That's our fancy term for things that either were alive, like the remains of dead plants and animals, or are alive, like me. I'm one of billions of critters that can be found in a single spoonful of soil. Wow, that's a lot of living things in such a small space. There are about seven billion people, but they're living on the entire planet. And not only are there a lot of us in the soil, there's also a lot of different kinds of living things. We call the different living things in an area, it's biodiversity. The bio part of the word means living, and the word diversity means different things. And soil has a whole heap of biodiversity. There are more different kinds of living things beneath your feet in the soil than there are above the ground. That's amazing. What's even more amazing is how the living things in the soil and life above the soil are connected. Take the plants in your garden, for example. They are stuck in the ground by roots, and those roots also help them slurp up things they need, like water. But they also release stuff into the soil, like sugar. Microscopic living things, called bacteria, can use this sugar to grow, 
And in return, some kinds of bacteria release things that the plants need. Well, that's a win-win. And that's only one example. Other living things called fungi also work together with plant roots. Fungi is a science word for the group of living things that includes mushrooms. It's kind of like how we talk about plants or animals. There are actually millions of different kinds of fungi, including the ones we see growing out of rotten logs when we hike, or the tasty mushrooms we like to eat. Just talking about fungi makes me hungry for some yummy mushroom soup. Exactly. Though these fungi I'm talking about in the soil don't look like the ones you put on your plate. They grow in super thin strands that extend outward from a plant's roots. In fact, they kind of act like extra roots that help the plant pull things from the soil. It is kind of nice of them, isn't it? Of course, they benefit too. In return for helping out, the plant gives the fungi some of the food it makes and other useful things. It's a sweet little partnership. Though not all soil fungi and bacteria hitch themselves to roots, some get energy by breaking down the dead plants and animals I mentioned earlier. They're what we call decomposers. You can think of decomposers as the soil version of the workers that pick up the recycling in your neighborhood. Think about what would happen if no one was ever there to pick up recycling. Whew, it would pile up. And so would dead plants and animals if decomposers weren't around. I agree, Squeaks. That would be terrible. Decomposers sound super important. They sure are. They also matter because lots of soil-dwelling animals eat them. So, in addition to cleaning up our neighborhood, the decomposers that live in soil are an important source of food for critters like worms and, and tardigrades like me. Then, after we eat them, the waste we produce acts as a fertilizer, helping plants above the soil stay healthy. Wow! I didn't know that our garden owes so much to all the tiny things that live in the soil. Thanks, Grady. Don't mention it. Now, if you'll excuse me, it's supper time, and I had my eye on some tasty fungi. So y'all have a nice evening. Thanks, you too. Bye. Squeaks, how about we go ahead and put our soil back in the greenhouse, and then we can have our dinner too. This next one doesn't have a name on it. Just a big question mark. Let's see what it says. Roses are red, but not me. I'm pink. I'm a bird with long legs. What animal am I, do you think? Oh, it's a riddle. Squeaks, based on the clues that it's a pink bird with long legs, what animal do you think sent this? That's right. I think our friend Frida Flamingo must have sent this. She loves jokes and riddles. Pink flamingos are the perfect animal for a day filled with red and pink hearts like Valentine's Day. You're right, Squeaks. We do have a video about how flamingos get their pink color. Good memory. Let's watch. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Oh. Hi there. Squeaks and I were just doing a little bird watching. It's so much fun to try to spot different birds. Today, we saw a cardinal, a goldfinch, and a blue jay. Good observation, Squeaks. Squeaks noticed that all of the birds we saw today were different colors. The cardinal was red, the goldfinch was yellow, and the blue jay was, well, blue. <laughs> it's one of the reasons I think birds are interesting. They're so different from one another. Some, like the ones we saw, are brightly colored, while others are less colorful. Some birds, like this mother mallard duck and its ducklings, have feathers that are brownish, and that's a good thing. Their feathers help the birds to blend into their marshy surroundings, making them harder to see. This helps them to hide from predators that might want to eat them. But birds with bright feathers are much easier to spot, and those bright colors might help birds to recognize one another or find a mate to lay eggs with. Good question. Squeaks wants to know what makes some birds so colorful. The answer is 
It depends on the bird. Sometimes the babies of even colorful birds start out with dull feathers and grow into their bright colors as they get older. And one of my favorite birds, the flamingo, has a really cool reason for its bright color. Now, when you think of flamingos, you probably think pink. And some flamingos are definitely bright pink, but others are reddish orange or white, and some are even more than one color. Yep, it's true. A newly hatched flamingo chick is whitish gray in color, and they stay that way until they're about one year old. Then something amazing happens. They start to turn color, and the secret is in how they eat. You're right, Squeaks. It does kind of look like the flamingo is doing a headstand. Flamingos aren't showing off when they have their heads upside down, though. They're eating. It looks a little silly, but flamingos eat by slurping up water in their beaks. They have a structure in their beak that acts like a strainer, catching pieces of food for the birds to swallow whole. You know, like the pasta strainer we have in the kitchen. They eat just about anything that they can slurp up, like tiny shrimp and insect larvae. Some of this flamingo food has what we call pigment in it. A pigment is a substance that gives things color. For example, the paint we use to make colorful pictures has different pigments in it. The pigment in flamingo food is orange colored. In fact, it's the same pigment that gives fall leaves, pumpkins, and carrots their orange color. As the flamingo eats, over time, the pigment in the food ends up in a flamingo's skin and feathers. And once it gets to the flamingo's feathers, it usually looks more pink than orange. And the more pigment that is in the food a flamingo eats, the brighter in color the flamingos get. In fact, if a flamingo stops eating food that has a lot of pigment in it, their feathers will fade back to white. So the flamingo's diet definitely causes its color. <laughs> oh, don't worry, Squeaks. Although the same pigment in the flamingo's diet is in carrots and some of the foods we eat, we're not in any real danger of turning orange. Flamingos eat thousands and thousands of larvae and shrimp every day and almost all of the flamingo's food has pigment in it. We would need to eat 10 carrots every day for a long time to start to turn orange. People eat lots of different things in their diets, not just one kind of food. And although carrots are a healthy snack, we prefer to eat a balanced diet with many different foods. Say, let's get a healthy snack and then do some more bird watching. Okay, <laughs> last one. Let's see who this is from. Yeah, you're right, Squeaks. This Valentine is a little bit stinky, and I think I know why. It's from our friend Darla Dung Beetle. Dung beetles roll up big balls of animal dung or poop that they use for food and lots of other things. It says, I hope you and Squeaks have a ball on this Valentine's Day. And to show I love you most of all, I rolled this card your way. How nice of her. Yeah, I'm happy she didn't send us a ball of dung again this year too. But even though it might seem gross to us, dung beetles can do really interesting things with dung. Hi everyone, Jesse here. I hope you, hi Squeaks, what's going on? Whoa, no way, you saw what? That's amazing. Squeaks was just saying that he saw a really strange insect today. He said it was a black beetle that was pushing a big ball of dirt. Oh, do I know what it is? Well, I think I do, and you're never going to believe it. The insect you saw was a dung beetle. Dung beetles are, well, they're a kind of beetle. Like other insects, beetles have six legs and two pairs of wings, but beetle wings are kind of strange. One pair is hard and sturdy, and it covers the back part of their bodies like a shield. Then underneath them is a second pair of wings that the beetles flap to fly around. Beetles are one of the biggest groups of animals. There are more than 350,000 kinds of beetles around the world. That's right, Squeaks, that's a huge number. Now, beetles in general are cool, but dung beetles are especially cool. They're a specific kind of beetle, and they live all over the world, on every continent except Antarctica and most of them are pretty small, not more than a few centimeters long. Dung beetles come in all kinds of colors, from black to shiny green. 
and they have body parts that you can use to tell them apart from some other beetles. Like, they have horns on the front of their heads. Dung beetles use these horns to fight each other for things like food or to fight over a mate, which is someone they want to have babies with. Dung beetles also have strong wings, which they use to fly around looking for, well, again, food. And finally, dung beetles have really strong legs. In fact, they're some of the strongest animals in the world for their size. I know, Squeaks, I haven't forgotten about that ball you saw your dung beetle pushing around. Do you have any ideas about what it was? I'll give you a hint. It wasn't dirt. Hmm, mud is a good guess, but mud is just wet dirt and soil. I'll give you one more hint. Think about why dung beetles might be called dung beetles. Exactly! That ball you saw the beetle pushing was made of dung. And dung is just another word for poop. When a dung beetle is flying around looking for food, it usually isn't looking for seeds or fruit, which are foods lots of other animals eat. Instead, it's looking for poop from bigger animals, like cows. When a dung beetle is exploring, it might come across a big pile of poop from a cow. And when it finds one, it will take some of that poop form it into a nice round ball, and then roll it away. Oh, great question, Squeaks, because you're right. Touching poop isn't something we should do because it has all sorts of germs that could get us sick. So what are dung beetles doing with cow poop? Well, lots of things. Once they have a dung ball, they roll it over to the tunnels where they live. And once they're there, they might bury the ball to save it for later or a female dung beetle might lay her eggs in the ball, kind of like how birds lay their eggs in nests made of sticks and grass. But the biggest thing dung beetles do is eat that poop. They suck the liquids out of the dung ball, and that's their biggest source of food. <laughs> I see your point, Squeaks. Eating poop isn't something we should do. It's not good for humans or robot rats. But dung beetles have been doing this for millions of years, so they don't get sick from it. In fact, they get all sorts of good nutrients from the poop. Nutrients are things like vitamins and minerals that help living things grow. If you've ever heard about vitamin C in oranges or calcium in milk, those are nutrients. Your body uses those things to help build bones and muscles and to keep your whole body healthy. And animals like cows and dung beetles need nutrients too. Animals like cows get their nutrients from eating plants like grass, but sometimes their bodies aren't able to get all the nutrients out of their meals. So some of those good vitamins and minerals travel straight through their bodies and end up in their poop instead. And that's when dung beetles show up. By eating poop, they get all the nutrients the bigger animals missed out on, and that keeps them healthy. They actually depend on the cows to poop so that they can get their food. This is also why female dung beetles lay their eggs in poop. When the eggs hatch, little larvae crawl out of them. They crawl right onto the poop so that they have a meal waiting for them as soon as they're born. Wow, thanks for asking, Squeaks. I'm so glad we got to talk about dung beetles today. Squeaks. I think I finally had a great idea for something super special we can send back to all of our friends this year. Do you remember when you and Jesse made your own heart-shaped candy? I think it'd be really fun to make some more of those and send them to everyone. What do you think? Great, let's check out that video to remind ourselves how to make them first. Oh, be careful, Squeaks. I knocked over this glass vase and I spilled some water. Aw, oh, thank you, I'm okay, I'm just a little bit wet. And at least the glass vase didn't break. Although if it had broken, it wouldn't have gone into the trash. We could have recycled it so that it became part of some new bottle or jar. Recycling is when you take something that's trash and turn it into something new. When glass gets recycled, it's usually crunched into chunks and then those get heated up until they melt. The melted glass can then be molded or shaped into new bottles and jars and those can get made into new bottles and jars. It's one thing to love about glass. It's recyclable over and over and over again. Oh, good question. Squeaks wants to know where glass comes from in the first place. It might sound hard to believe, but glass actually starts out as sand. 
Yes, the very same stuff that covers the beaches and fills our sandboxes. If you look really closely at sand, you'll notice that it's made up of lots of tiny pieces called grains. To make glass, you have to heat up those grains to a really high temperature, way hotter than we could ever do on a stove. I'm talking inside a volcano hot. When sand gets that hot, it melts. And those little gritty grains change from a solid into a liquid. Yes, you're right, Squeaks. It's just like ice and water. Ice is a solid. When it gets warmer, it melts and turns into liquid water. Now, Squeaks, what would happen if we took a bunch of ice cubes, melted them into water, and then cooled them down again? Would we get the cubes that we started with? That's right, we wouldn't. We'd end up with one huge block of ice instead. And that's essentially what happens with sand, too. And once you have liquid sand, if you cool it down again, it doesn't turn back into grains. It stays together in one piece, a piece of glass. If you want to get that sandy texture back, you have to break the glass back down into tiny little pieces. I think I know a way that we can show how this all works right here in the fort. Now, we can't melt sand. That would be way too dangerous. But we can use a sweet substitute, sugar. And you know, it's almost time for Valentine's Day, so we can show how much we love science by making some glass candy hearts. Now, you can do this with regular sugar, but it's a lot harder. You have to make it really hot, but not too hot. And, well, it's pretty tricky. So instead, we'll use a sweetener called isomalt. Let's take a good look at it. The isomalt really does look like sand. It's a solid and it's grainy. Isomalt isn't pink like this usually. That's a food coloring that's been added to it. Before we start making our glass candy hearts, let's take a look at what happens when we heat it up. Yeah, the sugar grains melt together and turn into a runny liquid. We have a heart-shaped mold that's safe to put in the microwave. So we'll pour our isomalt in and then microwave it. If you don't have a mold that can go in the microwave, you can also use a microwave-safe bowl or heat it up on the stove and then pour it into your molds after it's melted. And now, we wait for it to cool. What do you think will happen when the sugar cools? Do you think it'll turn back into sugar grains? I don't either, but we'll have to wait and find out. Okay, our hearts are nice and cool. Let's see what happens when we take them out of the mold. Oh, you were right, Squeaks. Look at that. Yeah. The melted liquid sugar got hard and clear. It didn't go back into grains at all. It kept the shape of the mold, a heart. It's just like if you poured melted sand into a mold to make a glass heart. Oh, you're right, Squeaks. Our candy is different from glass in a very important way we can eat it. Getting Valentines is great, but sending them is even more fun, don't you think? I can't wait to surprise our friends with homemade candy Valentines. Let's go to the kitchen and get to work. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you, and thanks for joining us. If you wanna keep learning and having fun with us and all our friends, make sure to click the subscribe button, and we'll see you next time here at the Fort.